Hey everybody, we are here to talk about a horror film. And honest to God, people in the woods getting hacked to pieces horror <laughs> film, which I feel like we haven't had in forever. Uh, the, the rights to Friday the 13th have been in legal limbo for at least a decade, if not more. Uh, there's supposed to be a TV show uh, called Camp Crystal Lake. There's like a pre prequel slash parallel quill to you know the Friday the <laughs> series that that apparently has fallen apart or is in some kind of trouble. So we have no Jason, we have no wooden slashers, but we do have opening today in theaters all over the place in a violent nature. The movie isn't opening in a violent nature. It's called in a violent nature, and it is opening. I just want to clarify that. Yes. You're going to watch this movie. Um, so we're going to talk about it. Writer-director Chris Nash, who is, uh, you know, I don't know his work. He's done some work on, like, what are the ABCs of death and some some smaller things. But uh, this is, like, I guess his big breakout uh, feature. And we're going to talk about it because I have thoughts. Now, joining me tonight are Katie Glidewell, the bald in front, a.k.a. the blonde in front, um, Jeff York of the Establishing Shot and Pipeline Artists. And uh, yeah, a couple of uh, huge horror nuts. Uh, I love horror too, so I think it's the perfect crowd to talk about this. The only one missing, I think, is Mark the Movie Man Krawcheck, but this we got early access to see this, so I'll have to catch up on Mark's thoughts later. But um, so yeah, in a violent nature, it's a classic. I mean, it is essentially a an art house Friday the 13th homage and that's being very generous uh yeah. there is a a a locket a, a necklace that is removed from uh this wooden kind of uh kind of campground area or is, is an old mining town i think with a with a fire tower and uh these teenagers these college kids are out in the woods messing around one of them finds a necklace and kind of pockets it even though there's a curse associated with it and immediately this uh, this decades old zombified killer comes crawling out of the ground and walks methodically through the woods and stalks the people that took his stuff. And that's the film. Now, you might say, well, I've seen that movie a hundred times. You've never quite seen it like this. It is pretty much up until what I'll call a cheat at the very end, almost exclusively from the killer's point of view, for better and worse. And uh, I'm trying to still make up my mind whether or not it's for better or for worse. So uh, let's go around the uh, the virtual room here and get some initial impressions. We're going to keep it spoiler free for this first bit. Then we'll get into some you know heavy spoilers later on because I know people have not seen this, a lot of folks. And I think uh, there's, I would dare say a lot of people, you're either going to be watching Furiosa this weekend or you're going to be watching uh, In a Violent Nature. Furiosa will have come out last weekend at this point but everyone's still gonna be watching it so jeff what did you what make of in a violent nature well i hate to say this because i'm sort of of two schools on it but perhaps it'll be interesting to talk about i found a lot of it interesting um i i know that he's going for something that's a little bit more uh deliberate methodical um it's imaginative kills in a lot of ways uh some very good special effects uh, some surprising things in it. Uh, and then on the other side, all a little bit familiar. And I, I don't want to always play the card, but I saw Friday the 13th in the theaters, folks. I'm a little bit up there in age. And I've seen this movie so many times, and I've seen it done different ways, and they've even tried to do it different ways in that franchise. And I think there's a lot of talent that Nash is displaying here. Um, certainly a lot of patience and sort of surprise in what he reveals visually. However, I think after a while it becomes a little, I don't want to say dull, but too, too precious in its deliberation. And it's like, oh, aren't I clever doing this? And look at how I waited to reveal that. And I just felt it, it started to seem very, very self-conscious. And I know that a lot of times the greats, whether it's Kubrick, Hitchcock, whomever, they do that a lot. But this doesn't have much other than that. Uh, there's very little character development. Um, the acting is very uneven. Uh, the script is uneven. I mean, I, I, I kept asking myself, is he deliberately writing these characters to sound like idiots because we want them to die? Uh, maybe so, but that's that's as old as the day is long. And I just think in this day and age, after 50 years, you got to do something that's a little more clever than that. If you're going to do this, it can't just be, 
I'm going to let the camera sit here for two minutes while the killer goes across the river <laughs> underneath or the lake <laughs> underneath the water, which is very clever. And then suddenly you see the girl uh, ah! like that and she's pulled under. But then we cut to another thing and see then it's not the killer's point of view. It's a very subjective point of view of him coming out of the water. So I felt that even in moments like that, he didn't need that extra part. He stops it being from the sort of killer's point of view, and he's getting almost into conventional filmmaking. Like, let me cover this from a couple of angles. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I said, I, I'm sort of of two schools on it. I liked a lot of it. I found it interesting. I was asking myself, if I was going through this, is he doing a deliberate attempt to show that um, violence and death doesn't need a score? It doesn't need all the effects and special effects. I mean, a little bit of the violence with the stuff, but even then, you know, he cuts away to some of it. Doesn't doesn't overstay its welcome too much, although it's pretty effective. But then, after a while, it. I just. I, I wasn't sure if he was just rambling because I felt the film sort of rambled. So, right in the middle, I guess. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Katie, how about you? So I saw this at Chicago uh, Critics Film Festival and the editor, Alex Jacobs, was there. And one of the things I have to give Chris Nash credit for is that they made this movie twice. Uh, there's only one scene in mm -hmm. the original that um, lasted to this next one. They uh, filmed it, they watched it, and they're like, no. And the only way we can repair it is to filmed the entire movie again with different things. Alex, um, yeah, Alex Jacobs was hired to be on the film for three months and he was on it for 18 months. And he believed in it in that month. He believed in it that much to stick with it. Honestly, I think what they did is innovative when you're mixing uh, aspects of horror movie uh, video games with an actual film. And I know everyone keeps saying Friday the 13th, but I think it has that synergy of Friday the 13th and Halloween where we have Michael Myers. You see him walking. You kind of see him at his point of view somewhat. But I thought the script would look. They had some really freaking clever lines with um, those teenagers or however old they are. I think they're a little bit older than teenagers. Yeah, they're like college and, probably. Yeah. yeah, college. I love the tropes and how um, you have a guy named Troy who – Spoiler, but not really spoiler. If you've seen basically any uh, movie out there, Troys are usually dicks. And spoiler, there's no, there's no, um, there's no difference in this. But uh, the practical effects were freaking fantastic. And I mean, this had some kills that even I had not seen before. I'm in the theater laughing my ass off because of what they're doing, and I'm like, oh my god. This is amazing. Uh, I mean, it's something when you see it on the big screen. Wow. But when you see it on the small screen, you get the same almost better effect because you get to see it up close and personal. Um, I also think like being in the woods and hearing the whippoorwill. Look, I went to camp and all that stuff. And whippoorwills are one of the most. I just always think of like, oh, nighttime and beautiful and all that stuff. And you're in a horror film and you just hear that whippoorwill singing. And I'm like, see, now you've just scarred me on whippoorwills. And if no one knows what a whippoorwill is, that is a bird that's in the woods, usually around some form of lake or something like that. Uh, go out and explore if you don't know what a whippoorwill is. Um, but no, uh, I think there's some of my, I mean, one of my favorite scenes in a horror film, we'll talk about it during a spoiler I have to give it credit that while there are a lot of things that are have been done before in um, certain aspects with kills and stuff, there's also a couple things that are just amazing and synonymous, hilarious. Um, there's a lot of tension in the end, which I thought was fantastic. I think uh, they really use the budget. Um, you can see that this was a, a fairly like lower budget film with the way they do little aspects like Hitchcock and Kubrick have done, where you don't necessarily need to see like someone getting stabbed, but if you see somebody get thrown and then you see a dead body with an ax on the back, hey, you just saved a lot of money by um, like missing that second part. There's some great long shots. There's also a lot of monotony with the walking. 
that is again very anyone who's played Friday the 13th as a player that is very common even the way um I think his name is Rye Barrett um, who plays lead Johnny I I mean that is very specific the way he is walking that is very similar to anything that's in a horror video game which I thought was great I know a number of friends of mine we're very bored by that. And I'm like, I'm used to seeing this. I have um, I haven't even played the games, but believe me, if you've watched them, this is a lot of what they do in the games. And I think it's, you know, very innovative to have to take that medium and then put it onto the big screen. Uh, yeah, I, I dug it. I mean, it's, you know, just with the way they, um, you know, did some kills in a different way, uh, did some kills in just beyond brand new way uh it's this is a film that i think definitely should be seen i can see it probably being in a lot of top tens for horror for the year uh just wait i know it's may we'll see uh but yeah there are just some scenes in it that i was freaking like seriously i was laughing my ass off even when we were i was pre-watching it for this i'm like oh my god i'm actually counting how many times someone got their head smashed Will <laughs> if you stick around for the spoilers, kids, I'm going to tell you that number because I counted and it's a lot. <laughs> well, we'll get to spoilers in, in just a moment. Um, I'm glad you really got in, you know, got on the movie's wavelength. I got to ask you, though, um, did the editor talk about what I mean, they, they shot the film twice. Mm-hmm. Is it that they shot it in the same manner that it was that ultimately the, the same form in which it ultimately ended up? Or do they shoot it as sort of a conventional horror movie? And they're like, this is not good. Let's do something different. And that's how they got to this particular perspective of the killer slasher. Because I'm curious. You mentioned it's a low-budget movie. I mean, that being said, uh, shooting a movie once is expensive enough. Shooting it twice, is it's got to be a headache. He did not get into that. In fact, he said, um, because I actually rewatched the video that I took um, from the Q&A. He said he didn't watch the first edit because he didn't want to have that preconceived in his head. Um, wow. But uh, once Chris, I guess, um, saw the end result, he was like, no, we need to redo um, everything. Mm-hmm. And I know that um, there's, I guess there's a number of interviews with Chris Nash where he talks about that when it was at Sundance. So I haven't looked at that. I know Katie Reif interviewed um, Chris Nash at Sundance and said that, they kind of talked about that, but I have not seen or read that interview. Well, I would hazard to guess if um, th- it's being put out by IFC, I believe. Yeah. So if they're IFC, smart. Shutter and Zygo pictures. Yeah. Right. Uh, if they're smart, what they'll do for the home video release is they'll put out an old fashioned Blu-ray or probably a VHS because that's that's coming back now as a novelty. Uh, they'll put both cuts of the movie on there. I don't know if he's embarrassed by it or, you know, he's obviously happy with the final product, but I'd be fascinated to see that, that difference. Um, Especially if he wasn't happy with that first version and he's happy with this, because my thoughts on in a violent nature is it would be a hell of a half hour short film, but to quote Randall from clerks Two, when talking about Lord of the Rings, he said, even the trees walked in that fucking movie. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I am not ashamed to admit it. Uh, during the, I got to a point where I was so fed up and I was watching this on my laptop. I started clearing out my Gmail inbox cause I got an alert saying it's 82% full. So what I did was, uh, I would delete emails, look through categories and stuff like that. And then when I heard the, the leaves stop crunching, I'm like, Oh, okay. Here comes a kill. And then I'd watch it. And then after about five minutes, I'd go back to, you know, clearing out my inbox, you know, because I was with this movie for the first, you know, good half hour or so. But then I realized that it was going to be this the entire time I checked out. And I feel kind of guilty about it. But on the other hand, I'm like, I don't know, maybe this is an audience, like a theatrical audience experience because the kills are a great punctuation. Uh, to what happens. There are some very tense uh, moments in here. Uh, there's some great gore, but just the rest of it, I could just see myself, even in a theater, getting like squirmy. Um, yeah, this this movie is alternately 
I like what it's going for and I like what it did, but it's also kind of a miss. I feel like 10 years from now, someone is going to take this concept and do it better. Um, not, you know, just do it more succinct. I mean, because like a, a lot of what he's doing is we are seeing the killer's point of view, especially towards the end of the horror movie when most of the camp counselors or the people in the woods have been killed off and you've got like two or three people left and like, Oh my God, there's a killer. He's after us. We got, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, and then the killer shows up and starts attacking them. We get all the stuff of like, how did he just appear in this place? Well, he walked a really long way and we get to see him walk a really long way to just materialize places and attack people. And it's a neat idea, but you know, over 90 plus minutes, it just, it gets kind of old. I found myself admiring the makeup job, uh, on this on this creature and really appreciating yes i'll say it again the friday the 13th style injuries on it. he's got like a bullet wound in the back of his head he's got a nice shoulder gash you know that we get to to see because he's come back a couple of times since he was first resurrected from the dead and he's fought people before and we get to see those battle scars it's really cool but in the end is it enough to recommend uh clips sure if someone does a fan edit, and I don't advocate piracy, but fan edits are a different thing <laughs> where they kind of get it down to a sleek 45, I'll give it that. I recommend that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an odd duck. See, Ian, I'm with you in the sense that, and I think the, the greatest value of a movie like that, honestly, is that it maybe stimulates conversation like this. Um, and the more I hear Katie talk, the more I don't like it. And that's nothing against you, Katie, because I respect your opinion and your take on horror. But I have to say, I vehemently disagree with you if you're going as a horror aficionado and raving about the violence and laughing at that. I just think if it's a horror comedy, that's one thing. If you're going, but but those are all told maybe six minutes of this 98 minute movie, and it just goes on and on. And, and I don't think it's a compliment to say it's like watching a video game where people walk around. Yeah, that's how video games are because. They, you're setting the pace, but that's a, it's, it's mind numbing for a film. Uh, I think my biggest problem with this film is you can tell there's talent there. He's got a point of view. He's trying to stick mostly to it. There's some very clever scenes as you talked about where, you know, the economy of like, you don't have to show the whole thing. And then some of the things he does show, like when the jaw drops away from that first kill, it's like, wow, that's pretty good special effect considering this was probably shot for X, Y, and Z. But to me, after all the horror movies you and I have seen, and I've been doing this for way too long, maybe I've seen these things, I demand more from a film. It's not enough to have good gore or good kills. This movie goes nowhere. Its, it's tone is the same in the first 10 minutes as it is in the last. And, you know, that all that time that is spent decapitating and, and cutting off the parts with the sawmill – that goes on for 10 minutes. I mean, I should have been doing my Gmail at that time, Ian. I just don't find that interesting enough, not in this day and age. And, and Katie, you've liked some great stuff. Compare this to It Follows, which had a sort of similar track in that there's this slow, methodical killer following and uh, the people's reaction to it. But there, they're smart. The girl who has the best death in it, the yoga player, I'm sorry, getting to well, half hold an hour. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's hold almost on. half an hour. Pause. Pause. Okay. But I'm just going to say about her reaction before we get okay. into that, if you don't sure. mind, is absurd. You know, first of all, nobody hears this killer coming up. It's silent. It's quiet, except for those, you know, nuances of the, the woods. And you hear this crunch, crunch after they've heard this story. And they turn around and she could run. She could do 100 things. She stands there and then just waits to be killed. I don't feel anything for her after that. She does. Watch it again. She waits no, to be I've killed. I've watched it three times. I know. Exactly well, then what are you? What do you? What do you? Spoiler, do you care about her? Do you care about her? Okay, okay, okay. okay. After that? All right, hold on. One Those things time, become absurd. It's like, I'm, why should I invest in anybody else in this movie? I don't know. That to me becomes crazy. Well, before we get before Sorry. we talk about investments, because I like this getting heated, it's getting violent. Just a All little. Right. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna pull over, folks, because we've kind of given our high level opinions. The movie is now playing, and I guarantee most of the people watching it, if you're watching this the day that this episode drops, have not seen it in violent nature. So take a break, go out and see it. I am recommending that you see it just for the, as Jeff pointed out, for the discussion. Um, and maybe, maybe you'll really dig it like, like Katie does. Um, it is worth watching and then come back and see what we have to say 
<laughs> uh, spoilers. I, I should have timed this better, but you know, hey, look, I was there, there you the go. Clock. I didn't say anything until 30 minutes in. <laughs> well, we got started a little bit late, so yeah, you're 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 okay. Now, as far as the yoga thing goes, and and folks, um, yeah, this is your warning. We're gonna go full spoilers from here on out. So yeah, you you've been uh, sufficiently warned. How many times can I say that? Uh, I agree and I disagree about the yoga girl yeah. because she is. <laughs> this is not in her favor. She's doing yoga at the edge of a cliff. Um. What edge of anyway, a edge of a cliff. Let's reiterate that, and edge that's bad writing. Both of you, that's yes. bad writing. I, I understand, but here's the thing oh, I we, we can't ever let her get away, so we'll put her at the edge of a cliff because that makes sense. That's Look, shitty writing. She's I'm doing sorry. yoga, it's shitty writing, Katie, because <laughs> the person doesn't know how to find a way to get her out of it, so all he has to do is surrender to it by saying, Well, I'm going to give her nowhere to run. I mean, it just that kind of turning a, a, a potentially smart or likable or, or empathetical character into a doofus. And it, you just it's like, excuse me, I see your strategy showing. I show your intent showing. It's not good writing. It is not. It is bad writing. Well, here's here's the thing. I would say it's bad writing if if there was a, a differentiation between what we'd seen of this character beforehand versus the way she ends up. Mm -hmm. One of my issues with this film is because we stick so much with the killer uh, for the most part, mm -hmm. a lot of what we know about these characters is from dialogue that we're uh, for a good example. She's kind of got this almost relationship with this other girl and they're, they're mm -hmm. out at the lake on the dock and they're kind of flirting with each other. And then she decides to go off and do yoga. I'm, they're having a flirtatious conver a conversation that I'm listening to from across the lake because we're with the killer, but I'm so concentrated on how the scene is set up and mm -hmm. what's going on. What should I be watching out for? Because I get the feeling I'm supposed to be on high alert for what could happen um, that I don't get a sense of who these people are, what their characters mm -hmm. are. I don't sense anything like funny or particularly interesting about them. And then the next time we see this, uh, this girl, um, she's being eviscerated at the edge of this cliff. Now, Jeff, I let's just say that it is kind of dumb to be doing yoga at the edge of a cliff. I, you know, people <clears throat> do all sorts of weird stuff. I mm -hmm. will not forgive because I was waiting for he's he's a big guy, this Johnny killer, and he's lumbering through the woods. Twigs are snapping. Leaves are crunching. I was waiting for as he comes upon her like, oh, she's got to have like iPod or AirPods, earbuds, yeah, she's earbuds. Listening to you know transcendental, <laughs> transcendental music or something. Yeah. No, she doesn't. So I'm like, how did you miss this? Now, when it comes to her reaction to seeing him, you know, she does scream and everything, and that she does turn around. She realizes, I think, that she does have nowhere to go. I will give it to her that I think she's in shock. Now, yeah. Jeff, Jeff, you could you could say that's bad writing. I'll, maybe I'll grant you that the premise of her doing yoga in that spot is terrible, but I'll say for the way that they resolve that scene, I think it's pretty honest because she's like, well, what am I going to do now? She doesn't, the shock I go down reaction. fighting. I would go down fighting. I, Sharon Tate was begging for the life of her child up until they put the first blade in her abdomen after seeing all of her friends die. I mean, I'm sorry. I think in this day and age to at least get us to like somebody or care about the people that are being slaughtered. This is why people started to cheer for Jason Voorhees because you put yeah. the easy marks up against him and he's lumbered around and people still can't outrun him. Uh, you know, they're saying he's, he can't be killed. So let's try to kill him. No, let's get the hell out of there. Run away. I, I, Honestly, I mean, I don't want to get so uh, huffy about this, but after a thousand of these kinds of movies, and we've seen this played out, I just think you want to see something that shows these people are a little smarter than that. And they're just not. And well, that kind but, of thing but, could have been smart. Although it's a great kill. It's the best kill in the movie. It oh, is. Yeah. But here's the thing. I, here's the thing. <laughs> I don't. I mean, by far. What I, by far. What I, but what I want to give Nash, and you know, the, I think the actress does a very fine job with what she's mm -hmm. given. Yes. Uh, probably probably one of the best performances in the movie, as brief as it is. I do want to give him the fact that as much as he's uh, kind of taking the, the, the stuff that we know of the genre, the tropes, and looking at them from a different angle, I think, at least in my experience, I've rarely seen shock and panic when the killer comes up. Usually it's they're scrambling to like, you know, dodge to the left or the right and the killer just reaches out and grabs them or they start screaming mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, begging for their life. She goes into shock. And I appreciated that. 
What I didn't appreciate, and this is the key difference, I think, between this and the movies that it is uh, taking that skewed angle towards, the Friday the 13th films, those movies largely probably due to censorship back in the, the 1980s. The MPA was notoriously scissor happy with those films. Uh, they were quick kills. With mm-hmm. this, particularly with our yoga girl, like I get that he has to be elaborate with it because he is actually uh, ramming his uh, railroad hook or whatever through her st- through her abdomen. Then he hooks her head and bends that around and then pulls her head through her own stomach and out the other side. And you see the, the tightening He's like, ur, ur, ur. Mm-hmm. it goes on for a long time. It turns into almost like a Texas chainsaw massacre, like butchering an animal kind of thing or, or dressing a rabbit. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, the horror of it was lost when we just spent so much time on the, how it's being done. I think about, um, what I the the main thing I heard about this movie was oh my god the kills are amazing, and I immediately popped into my head, I immediately popped in my head what the hell, uh, the most <laughs> impressive kill that I think I've seen in a horror yeah, the yeah. most impressive kill I think I've seen in a horror movie in the last probably fifteen years, and I certainly haven't seen all of them, was the head kill from Adam Green's Hatchet back in twenty ten where there's the the lady who um, Victor Crowley comes up behind her and grabs her mouth and then rips her head open and then the tongue is kind of hanging out. That is an effect that I still don't quite understand how they pulled that off. <laughs> it's like the neck arrow scene from Sleepaway Camp. It's just you watch it and you're like, that looks like someone actually got horribly murdered on film. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's it's a, it's a really solid kill. But like a lot of the murders in this movie... Jeff, you mentioned the thing of the sawmill at the end taking 10 minutes of screen time. I feel like that's being generous. Yeah, um, maybe so. <laughs> because at a certain point, because these characters are either dead and they're still being just brutalized, right. or they may be knocked unconscious, at that point, you're just dealing with meat. Yeah. The, what, what's the, the point of that? What is the right. point of that? Do people go to horror just to see gore? I mean, if you are, those aren't film fans I want to talk to because there's no intellectualism in it. There really isn't. And we can say, oh, it's great. And, and maybe to your point, Ian, it goes from horror to humor, which I think Katie's point may be. And maybe that's a societal examination. But I find it monotonous after a while. And and just I, I don't need to see, oh, now is it going to look like he actually gets his head cut off by this bus off? Yeah, pretty good. Good job for whoever did the special effects on that. Is that enough to watch a movie? No, it isn't. And it should not be. The 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 ranger, the park ranger uh, at the end, who is our Tommy Jarvis character, you know, yeah. like my dad fought you when you first came back and then I fought you after you killed yeah. my dad or whatever. And I'm going to get my <laughs> revenge and things don't work out. Right. Um, you know, he gets I guess he gets paralyzed. Um, some I think he gets his neck cricked and but then yeah. he gets dragged into the shed and then put up on this this log chopper, which is kind of a cool effect. But once you see what happens with the log, you're like, okay, okay, audience, this is what's about to happen to this guy. Then we see his arm get cut off, and then we see his head get cut off. But by the time, not that I'm a cruel person, but kind of like what I was talking about with meat, I want to see some kind of a reaction. I want to see him like whimpering or close-ups on his face, like he realizes what's happening, he can't do anything about it, or he's screaming or crying or something like that because at that point the scene goes on for so long that i was surprised that he we didn't get close-ups of johnny like adjusting the dials and like you know oh is this still plugged in like what are you doing i thought there was going to be like like a jam like the blade (laughs) jammed on bone then you know uh, has to go over and pull it out and readjust it and you even, know something you know, to at least like make it funny but no well or or even more horrifying because like you hear guillotine stories about sometimes it didn't yeah. work and they'd have to have the the blade yes. go up like have it get stuck and then have the the park ranger's face going like oh yeah, my yeah God. like like pure agony but there's Ooh. he's just he's dead or paralyzed mm-hmm. and there's nothing there uh i did like the you know the rock kill that was kind of fun um, that was immediately that came after the uh, the axe throwing scene, which I thought was kind of imaginative. Katie, yeah. I want to go back to the, the video game comment. I don't know if anyone will ever fully crack this, at least not to my satisfaction, because I think there is something here about following Johnny around Johnny the killer as if you are Jason in that Friday the 13th video game and stalking people. 
I think the reason I was bored is because I wasn't playing. Like if yeah. you're playing a video game, there is an aspect of even if you're just walking around the woods, you're either playing <clears throat> as Jason on the lookout to like kill someone. So you got that charge like, oh, am I going to come across a couple of campers having sex and which tool am I going to use to bisect them? Or <laughs> you are a, I think I only played a demo of that game once and I was freaked out because I was as a camper. I'm like. I felt like I was in the woods and behind, you know, every tree, there could be someone waiting to grab me or my friends and how am I going to get away? Um, there was a, there was a mode, I think, or a story point where there was like a, the beat, like the car can only hold two people and there are three people left. So who's going to get left behind? You know, that's terrifying. Um, but yeah, with this movie, there's a lot of walking, a lot of stalking, but I never felt that tension of, I know I'm not going to kill anybody. And the killer, I am the killer, so I'm looking in on people and attacking them. So I don't didn't have any fear associated with it. It's like this movie takes the dread out of the horror movie, which is an interesting concept. I just don't know that it sustains the length of a full horror movie. Well, basically, it's like Johnny is a shark and you're following a shark as he's eating. It's like, I mean, mm. the shark's got to swim and Johnny's got to walk. He's not he's not running. He's not um, hopping. He's not. It's like you just see him going, 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 going. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't eat. He just walks and kills. I uh, do want to comment, though, on the yoga girl. You guys act like they um, this girl knew that there was some killer in the woods the entire time when she's on the cliff, the cliff that is a 200 feet drop. She's on the cliff because she was planning on doing the yoga on the um, thing by the lake with the girl that she was flirting with. But the girl's like, oh, let's go for a swim instead. It's like, no, I want to do yoga. So I'm going to do yoga. You do the swim. When she hears the crackling, she thinks it's her friend coming. She's still doing yoga. And that's why she said, it's like, I wonder when you're going to come. It's not like she's surprised or she doesn't hear it. She hears it. But she thinks it's her friend because no one said, by the way, you're going to be staying in this um, cabin and there's a serial killer on the loose. So if you do something stupid like this, make sure. Yes, they tell the story of some um, thing that happened. Like I thought it was at 70 years ago, but then the ranger comes and like Johnny came back and it was 10 years ago. I mean, everyone has those stories of stuff that happens. That doesn't mean that you like stick inside the cabin because you think some mythical creature is going to come out and get you. You're going to still live your life. And yeah, Ian, I would say it was shock. She was in freaking shock because she is out there seeing this beautiful view, looking out. She's with nature. She's the one who was like, you know, um, by the way, all the ciders are mine. And Aaron's like, yeah, we know because you won't stop talking about them. You get the personalities of the characters at this um fire pit you realize aurora is kind of the hippy dippy like i'm gonna do this don't annoy me um alice who also starts to video her, her friend who's talking about um johnny in a way that you know gets in but yeah she was in shock it's not like she i mean she's like you see this like i think he's like six foot five or something i mean he's huge 280 yeah. pounds when you think that the chick who is going to hook up with you is coming she is in shock and it's like she goes to the edge of the cliff and realizes i either fall to my death or whatever this guy and wait there's a thing right through me so now i don't really have a choice it's not like she didn't try and run away she did try and run away and fortunately she ran to the edge of a cliff which was gonna kill her anyway so she was kind of a goner um i'll, I'll do like i just want to i just want to step in with an agreement and a disagreement okay the disagreement is okay i I'll, I'll have to give it to you a little bit but you know because yeah she was expecting her friend but unless i mean i don't know unless she was trying to do something she was thinking it was something sexy like oh my friend's coming up to meet me but she's not going to say a damn thing <laughs> like you know hey i'm back from the water hey you want to go do yoga hey you want to go make out no it's just like someone approaching you in the woods without making a sound you look I'm sorry. I don't care how into your it, it would have been better, honestly, if she had just had some air but some ear airpods in. But the other thing is, yes, I think the shock comes into play with, and we've seen this in some of the yes, the Friday the 13th movies. Um, there's the campfire story, and then when these people are confronted with Jason Voorhees, they're like, Oh my god, 
the stories are true. And now this thing is in front of me. What the hell? That yeah. will mess with your brain. And I, I get it. Um, but uh, yeah, I and I did like I like some of the others, you know, the little nods that they do, like they take the group photo at the campsite and you realize that Johnny is in the background and you can just see his face. And then later on, they make reference to, yeah, I told you it was his face. And like, no, that, that's not. It's just a smudge or, or a mm -hmm. trick of the light or something like that. So you get the sense of the movie that's going on that we're not able to see. But yeah. in a lot of cases, I was like, I'd kind of rather be watching that movie, even though I've seen it a dozen times. Well, and that's I mean, and I can understand that. But that's the thing that goes into the character of Troy. I mean, Troy is the stereotypical trope of the dick guy. I mean, I at don't one even point, know who Troy is. I you Troy keep you seen this more than I have. Katie, why do you give so much intellectualism to a movie that has so little of it? The character development is not what you're saying it is. It is it is paper thin. It is cliche. The fact that you're talking about tropes is right away should be a criticism. You've seen a thousand of these movies. You got to do something smarter. You got to engage us more. It's not enough. You know who did a better job of the point of view of the killer? Maniac about 10 years ago with Elijah Wood. They had a point of view of the killer too. And he had trouble killing people because it didn't all go smoothly. This guy, they, it's a point of view until it isn't, uh, you know, it's, it's violent and, and sort of thoughtful and clever and all this until it isn't that bit that you said with the picture, that's the promise that I think this film had. I think this filmmaker shows some promise in the deliberation and some of the way he shoots it, but ultimately this film goes nowhere. And that just bothers the hell of me because that's what killed the Friday, the 13th franchise. It just became monotonous And this film hey, in 90 hey, hey, minutes. They went to space, Jeff. They well, space. exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, and you I guess I just realize to me what I liked about it follows films was in this, right? Well, Which but one? but to me, this is like what else you got? If you're gonna if you're gonna do a movie twice, and this is the amount of intellectualism in a film, I don't know. It's like what could he have done if he sat down and wrote a different, better script? Maybe the problem is in the way he shot it. Maybe it's the fact that he's not really saying much here. I don't think there's much being said here. And I think you're saying, oh, Troy is a trope. Those are the kind yeah, of things. Yeah, and I'm not saying that's an that was a positive. You didn't let me finish. Well, you're saying that he's a, a dick in every one of these movies. All the reason to not write that dick into this movie. I mean, I think what I liked about it follows is, and, and that wasn't a perfect film, but it was sort of the relentless slow killer coming on you, but you didn't know which person it was. And sometimes the audience has seen it before the person in the thing. That at least is amusing. I didn't find it particularly amusing to try to relate to the guy, especially, I'm sorry too, over the shoulder is not his point of view. The point of view well, is from the camera thing. Yeah, and, and as mean, soon as they cut to him coming out of the water after killing her, and the body floats up, you've thrown away that 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 motif, and it it and it doesn't work. It's either you're going to do that the whole time and force me in this weird, ugly, awful world to relate to a killer directly by doing this, or you're not. And so I, I shame the director for that. He doesn't even cling to his. One original idea that he had is I'm sticking with the guy from his point of view. He doesn't. As soon as we're in the car with the two people at the 10 minute scene at the end, which has some real good tension to it, we've stopped identifying with with uh, the the killer. So I don't know what he's doing. He's all kind of over the map on some of this stuff. Again, I liked a lot of the cleverness. I can see this guy as some some filmmaking uh, uh, acumen, but I'm sorry on face value. It's not there, that intellectualism. Uh, the things that he thinks he's doing, he breaks breaks his own rules. And those kind of things confounded me. Katie? Uh, <laughs> well, the two points of view, the two points where we don't get the killer's point of view is the beginning and the end. Why is that? There's well, a few there, other times in the middle where there, it's not two either. We see there, people there. talking and doing stuff, then and he's in the background somewhere. And we also switch around the camera around to what I thought was a really interesting scene where he uh, they throw the keys into the woods and he finds them and he sits down and we the camera turns around. We actually get to look at him and he's playing with this little red toy truck as, as the dialogue is right. going on behind them. So, I mean, that's the thing I. When I say killer POV, yes, that's 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 my mistake because well, it's not that's the way it's it, being sold, though. That's the way it's right. being sold, and it's not but, true. But it's not, it's it's kind of like the um with the Lion King when that came out a few years ago. We got the notes from the publicist, like it's not a live action <laughs> Lion King, it's it's a realistic animation or something like that. This this point of view that we've seen <clears throat> is from a lot of especially the later Friday the 13th movies where 
it's not killer's point of view but it is killer over the shoulder like we're we're following jason through the woods from his back you know as he's, mm -hmm. he's stalking so it's point of view adjacent yeah so and i didn't mean to put that jason pun in there i was gonna um, say is that so, a jason Voorhees? I, I... no it's not adjacent <laughs> adjacent Voorhees. that's his that's his ne'er-do-well cousin so katie jump back jump back in here katie i'm sorry so yes, one, you guys do realize that um, a actress from Friday the 13th part two Ooh. was in this film. Was it? I look, I thought that was Amy Steele, the, the lady in the truck. No, it is not. Amy is it, but it's Steele. not. Who, who was it? <laughs> she was in Friday the 13th part two. It is, what is her name? Uh, Lauren Marie Taylor. She was the girl. Yes. When, you know, the guy that's in the wheelchair and the girl that, um, is liking him and stuff like oh, yeah. that. Friday too. Yeah, yeah. That's Laura Marie Taylor. Mm -hmm. But who is she in this? She's the woman in the truck. The, oh, that's her. Okay. I yeah. See, when I I thought she looked more like Amy Steele, and I looked up her name, and I didn't recognize the actress's name. I don't know what what I was. I watched it very early one morning. Um, but wow. Okay. Uh, she certainly ended up better than she did in Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. Um, oh yeah. Well, yeah. and I know there's a number of people that I talked to after the screening, which one of the things that's been hyping this up, too, is that the Chicago Critics Film Festival, if you've seen like in IndieWire and Bloody Disgusting and all that stuff, they said that someone was so freaked out that they threw up during the screening. Now, I did not hear that or smell that or see that. <laughs> I know three other people who said the exact same thing. If they did... They definitely got out in time because I mean, yes, that is a big theater, but at the same time, my senses my senses are a little bit heightened right now. I feel like I would have gotten a whiff of that. Definitely, probably would have heard it at some point. But whatever, if they're going to use that hype train, it happened with Raw. I think at Toronto in an, um, Toronto After Dark, where they said someone fainted and stuff like that. Good for you. If someone got sick, whatever. One of the things, though, and I know, Jeff, you were saying that it's like, why didn't this person run? All that stuff. Let's talk about the last kill. Let's talk about the last kill. The last kill with Colt, where you have the whole stereotypical, hey, you son of a, and Johnny oh, just yeah. freaking hits him on the face mm -hmm. five mm -hmm. times. Yeah. Five times. You see Chris in the background, who you know they've come up with this plan. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to do this. And then you've got the bear, the coyote trap, and you've got the gasoline, and we'll put him on fire. And then when Johnny has Colt on the ground, I counted. Chris is in such shock. When she puts the stuff down, that is that is whack number 40, not mm -hmm. including the five he did on the tree. When he's on the ground, <laughs> he's hit him 40 times at that time. Mm -hmm. When she takes off the necklace and puts it around the gasoline... And you still, and she's walking away, and you still hear him going. That was up to 93. 93 wax. That's a lot of diligence to do that. But she freaking keeps going. And even though she's far away from whatever's going on, she's got that t um, PTSD of hearing those wax in her head and still keeps going. So here is a heroine who is the final girl. She doesn't try and take a stand. She doesn't try and kill him, but she freaking just like, this is insane. He's just smashing my um, friend's head into a pulp. I'm just going to lay this down right here. I'm going to take off this dumb necklace that my dick of a boyfriend gave me. I'm going to put this right here and I'm going to walk away. And that's, um, I mean, Colt's, um, Colt's death was one of my favorite deaths because, I mean, the fact that it just kept going. Uh, it's crazy. It's, I mean, is it too much? Yes. It's beyond too much, but it's just like, it's more of the actress's reaction when she sees that and just like, let's, let's, let's not do, let's not, I'm, I'm not the hero. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk away from this. And then, you know, he, um, he had his mother's necklace back. So then he's done. Okay. Three things. <laughs> <laughs> One. Now, I'll chalk this up to maybe because these people are new to this experience and they've heard everything through legend. Um, they don't know shit about how the lore actually works. But when they when they're talking, I don't know if it was the park ranger scene or one of the others where they're like, oh, oh yeah, it was the park ranger scene because they're like, well, we'll just give him his necklace back. And the park ranger said, look, 
he's already up and walking around. Giving him the necklace back isn't going to do anything. We've got to put him down. But apparently, unless the end of the movie suggests that, yeah, he took the necklace back, but he's still going to be around killing people. Um, you know, that that just seems like a bit of a lore break. I can maybe forgive it because, again, it's an interesting idea that these myths that have been passed on through generations. It's kind of like the game of telephone. Not everything yeah. is going to work as you think it's, it should. Mm. However, uh, the cult death, that's the guy. Um, I had to rewind it because I could not believe how unbelievably stupid that guy was when he <laughs> says, hey, you ugly son of a bitch. That's the thing you yell from like 50 feet away. So you have a place to run. He was literally standing right behind Johnny. <laughs> so Johnny oh, yeah. turns around and axes him in the face. And then I'm going to get to the third point. This is kind of like 2B. Um, he keep, Johnny keeps whacking him and everything you know i get he's a maniac and as he's uh, alluded to earlier much like mr Voorhees, he was uh in when he was alive he was kind of uh slow uh but 93 wax when he knows that this girl is over here with the necklace with the gas can and the bear trap he ha he has he has seen he was looking at her right before colt said hey you ugly son of a bitch to get him to turn around and take the attention off of her right so he's it's comical this is a screenwriting thing this is not a hey this would actually happen in the moment this is a wouldn't it be amazing for the audience to have to sit there and listen to the the pulp the um, slack 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 it's i get it it's cute but i don't think it works as a story what i think does work as a story and i hadn't thought about this until you put it out there she is a final girl but she's the only final girl who does not stand to fight and, yeah. you know, she she runs. And I think that's a really interesting idea. It reminds me of Sidney Prescott's thing uh, from Scream when she's talking about the cliche of like, you never run upstairs, you always like, run out the front door and go get help. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the frustrating thing about this film is I feel like there is, like I said, 10 years from now, the, the next Chris Nash is going to have watched this movie and be like, I love these movies. I think this movie is OK. I can do it one better. And. I'll be there for it. The last thing I'll say as a big positive, and I hate this because there's so much that I do like about this movie that I just don't think it holds together as something I can really recommend, even though I am recommending that horror buffs go out and check it out because it is something different. Whether or not that works for you, that's up to, to you. But what you're talking about, the sounds of the woods, and when our heroine, what's her name? Chris. Chris, okay. Chris is also like that's the name of like there have been a lot of Chris uh, like final girls. I think you got Troy, the asshole and Chris, the final the, the final girl um, when she's running through the woods and there's all that sound. There's the crickets and the birds and the and the coyotes and all this other stuff, not to mention the, the leaves and the branches rustling underneath. That's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And you realize that we never hear that in these movies because that's always the horror score you know, for the audience ramping up the tension. For me, I was intense just thinking like I'm trapped in the woods with this guy coming after me and I don't know where he is because this cacophony of nature is shrouding out or clouding out his, um, you know, my ability to track where he's at. So, yeah, I think it, that was pretty cool. Um, when she hooks up with um, the lady in the truck at the end, uh, I immediately had flashbacks to Sleepaway Camp Part 2. Unfortunately, it doesn't end like Sleepaway Camp Part 2 because that speech about I had a, my brother or my brother-in-law was attacked by a bear. That goes on for about 10 minutes. And at the end, when, again, there's an art to subverting expectations. But if you're going to subvert the expectations to say, hey, we're going to string you along and then absolutely but fuck, nothing is going to happen. I can't I can't get behind that ending at all. I can understand that. I mean, the, yeah, the Bobby story where you just, I think, I feel like the Bobby story was only supposed to talk about how um, there's this hen house syndrome or hen house disease where animals just kill the kill. They don't, uh, they don't kill for the food. They don't do that. And it's like, I feel like that was supposed to have a kind of a um, re relate relatability factor to Johnny. It's like once he gets on this revenge thing, he's just he's just kill. It doesn't matter if they had nothing to do. I mean, I mean, who knows how Johnny like how is Johnny a zombie? How is Johnny like six foot five when he obviously was a child when he died? And then 
a week later, you know, all the firemen and um, people that were involved in his death and his father's death got ripped to shreds and they said it was um, an animal attack or something like that. Who knows? I mean, we're obviously not going to get into the voodoo stuff or whatever it is. I'm sure it's probably going to be something to do with his mother. I have no idea why does his mother's necklace um, keep him from like, you know, making him rest. Who knows? Why does someone see a necklace that's gold in 2023 and see, is that real gold? What year is this? Who cares? It's a freaking necklace that's on a piece of wood out in the um, piece of bark, out, like piece of wood out in the woods. Why do you think it's like, I'm going to take that and give it to my girlfriend? Really? Really? It, that's what you're going to it's, it's a free gold necklace. Come on. It's a free no. and it's real gold. I think like, Katie and I have now real. done the Freaky Friday thing where she's arguing my point of view on the stupidity <laughs> of this film. <laughs> So I guess next Look, thing I got to say, that was a righteous kill, man. I never saw so much gore. Yeah. I mean, it's Listen. real gold, you guys. So obviously this guy had to take the necklace. But I mean, it's stuff like that that's like, I don't know why this is happening. But half the time we don't. It's like, I mean, look at Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, he was what, 11 when he died? And then in two, apparently he's like 20 something and he's able to... um Take his mom's head. How did that wait? What if your mom killed all these people because you died? Then what? So then is she a Karen? Like, what is what well, is the going only on? difference, Katie? Is I'm not defending Friday the 13th. I think it was a terrible franchise and it was a terrible first movie. I, I don't think that you can just first say no, what well, terrible. And if you ever seen the backstory or read about it, it was done purely as a crass commercial make money kind of thing. The only thing they had was the surprise of it's the mom at the end, the rest yeah. of it was just cheesy as hell. And 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 a little bit unintellectual. I just, I'm sorry, but uh, as you and I are both horror fans or all three of us are horror fans and you and I have written about it extensively. I, at this day and age, I want something more out of horror. It's not enough for me to say, oh, those kills were so cool or, oh, this is almost so horrible. It's violent and funny at the same time. Or, you know, this is a, a homage to the girl who saved the guy in the wheelchair until she was killed. And I think she was hung upside down, if I remember. But whatever. Um, no. I, I just don't think any of that is enough to go to see a horror movie. I think there has to be more story. I think there has to be more character. If it's an exercise and like, hey, you know, it'd be cool if we followed the killer around. Great. As Ian said, make it a short film and, and have something funny happen to him that usurps the whole thing. But at the end of the day, I want horror stories to have story too and not just be great effects or, you know, satires of this or casting Easter eggs. I just think those are not enough to sustain this. And this guy shows some talent, but if he made this all over again, I'd hate to imagine what that first film was like because this is not worth it. I mean, Listen. it is in some ways to discuss this very thing we're having there, but I just don't find that intellectual or interesting horror in this day and age. Not after all the horror movies we've seen. Two, two things, Jeff. Sorry. Yes, my dear, my dear, dear friend. <laughs> um, Friday the Thirteenth may have been Sean Cunningham's license to print money, and it certainly turned out <laughs> to be a, a great one because it's a, an enduring franchise that many people, myself included, are begging to come back. I was oh, in, really? even keen on. I was keen an A twenty four TV series about Friday the Thirteenth. Yes, mm -hmm. sign me the hell up. I'd love but, to see what they would do with it, but I don't know. I maybe that's why I, they I, didn't do it. It wasn't interesting enough. I don't know. But go ahead. Well, I, I think, and you know, I don't know when the last time you watched Friday the 13th, the first one was, I think as a cash grab movie, I think there's a lot more going on than just the twist of the mom being the killer. Uh, I think some of the, the, the kills were, were positively artsy, like yes. Ned, when, 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 you know, Kevin Bacon and that one chick are making out in the cabin and then you pan up the making bunk bed out. and you yeah. see, yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. they started making out and then they you know okay okay, okay. <laughs> right there, there's a lot of cool stuff going on the 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 one guy in the the plaid western shirt it's revealed like the door opens and he's like on the other side and he's so horribly mutilated he's got like a an arrow from a bow and arrow through the crotch you're like how did this guy die but uh i will say and i completely lost my other point damn it that they really deteriorated dramatically even after that oh oh i do i do remember <laughs> jeff yes here's my question and okay. i might be an impossible question uh oh but i think i think we'll we'll kind of end on this note um it sounds like 
you should not watch slasher movies anymore <laughs> because yeah, i'm just curious really... like what and, and i'm not i'm not saying that as a criticism i'm i too love movies that make me think that make me feel that you know terrify me and everything mm -hmm. and i'm just wondering do, is there a world that you can conceive of where you can watch a slasher film a kids in the woods with a, a phantasmic killer that brutalizes people that would stimulate you in that way or is it just this is a subgenre that you just need to kind of pack away? Well, partially, maybe yes, but I will say this Cabin in the Woods, Maniac, it follows. Those kind of films had a lot of the auspices of this kind of genre to them, and they did them better. Um, they found an angle, they found a fresh take on it. I, I think something that to me is so much that it seems like nothing more than an homage to it, and then it goes nowhere with really no real intellectualism, no real twists or surprises. Again, like even if he was like having trouble getting that log thing to work, you know, it might have been kind of amusing. It's like, oh, it is hard to kill. You know, he thinks he's he's got all the brute strength and yet here he is technology betraying him. I don't know. I just, I find these kind of simple things where in order to make it work, the characters have to be dumb. Everybody has to fall down. Everybody conveniently hits a bear trap or some sort of thing, except for the killer who's walking around all the time and doesn't even look down. I just, I find that kind of stuff. I'm aware of the filmmaker cheating to make this work as opposed to find me a way. And I'll give you just a one quick example. And we've talked about this before and I bring it up all the goddamn time. But one of the things I loved about Fright Night, the original Fright Night, is Charlie was never less than really smart. Now, maybe he wasn't believed because it was a teenager. Maybe he was a little too volatile. Maybe he overplayed his hands at times. time. Maybe he wasn't smart enough to realize that Peter Vincent was a, a hammy British actor, not a real vampire killer. However, he never is dumb in it, and he's doing things in it that are smarter than most of the people who are in these situations. He was a good foil for Jerry Dandridge. And I want good foils. I want people who are a little bit smarter. You know, I want Mia getting on that on that bike and biking away when she sees the killer in her home. I got to get as far away from him as I can. So I'll bike at least half a mile and get a head start on this slow moving killer. When, when these people are just waiting and, oh, somebody's dead. And, oh, well, I just, I guess I run into the woods now. I, or like, we've got to stop and stay and kill him. Really? That's what the sheriff thinks to do? Like, he doesn't want to call out the National Guard. So I, those things in this day and age, I start to go, they're too stupid to like, and, and, and I'm sorry, but that's what killed Friday the 13th. That's what killed Freddy Krueger and all those things after a while is you you lost the story. You lost the plot. That's my new favorite phrase, Ian, <laughs> is they lost the plot. When I start cheering for the killer, and maybe that's what the old intent of this is, sort of giving a, that sort of a Jason Voorhees point of view of it, then maybe that's where horror goes into being so meta or something. But for me, this just seemed like some very good, well-directed uh, sensibilities for vastly inferior material. And maybe maybe that kind of guttural slasher movie is just not my cup of tea anymore. But I thought this one's released by IFC and was part of the Chicago Critics. I don't know what they saw that was so great. And as many times as I've talked to Katie about the best horror movies, I don't know how you're seeing all that in this film that I don't think, I mean, you should write that because that's better. That wasn't on screen. What? Well. All the stuff you said, you're giving it far too much credit than this is. <laughs> That's that you're you're writing a smarter movie as you explain it. That is not on screen here. Well, I think, um, yeah. Again, I had two points. I completely lost them because I'm tired. Um, I'm sure <laughs> they'll Jeff, come don't back. Ever oh, see oh. a slasher movie again. And I'm not going to invite you on for those slasher talks. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, look, we might have to talk about Friday the 13th. So I'm going to bring you around, sir. Oh, all right. Okay. Katie and I are going to team up to make you a fan of that film. I like um, I like uh, Halloween, uh, the original Halloween a lot. Okay. But yeah. who's your favorite character in Halloween? Jamie Lee Curtis. Okay. She's the there only one who's paying attention. Uh, Michael, uh, one of the things regarding Michael. like what you've been saying, it's like, you know, if people start um, rooting for the killer, I feel like the reason why people are going to see these movies is to root for the killer and see what the killer does. I mean, in Which Friday 13 and Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, let's talk about Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street is basically about a pedophile who attacks children. And yet. Yeah. He is one of the most love horror icons in like yeah, in the in, first movie, in the, the first couple movies. I would say Rennie Harlan's movie. I think he was a pretty 
formidable villain and you're still rooting for the teens. I mean, after that, maybe not so much, but that's maybe these are bigger discussions. I'm sorry if we have to end and wrap this up, but that, that's a good point. But I think after a while they take that turn and it's like the, the teenagers are just so dumb and they're fodder and you want them to die. And they, they, you start investing in the, the, the franchise cause it's the killer. I, I, think I would say that there was a version of a horror film with like Dawson's Creek teenagers <laughs> and a horror icon. I'll tell you what I think is the best franchise of the last 20 years is final destination because there's no definite villain that you see other than perhaps whatever fate is. And the smarter teenagers avoid it longer and figure it out. It becomes a little bit of a mystery. I like that. I thought that's where the potential victims are at least trying to, out with their fate. I, I just don't like them. Oh, I'm running through the woods when I shouldn't even be in the woods. Uh, yeah. I mean, I agree. The, the final destination movies, I mean, some of them were kind of goofy, but I did like that. At least the, the filmmakers are setting up these elaborate kind of Rube Goldberg machines. And so, sometimes the teenagers get out of them, which is kind yeah. of clever. Like they don't die quite the way you expect. At least the, not right. on film yeah. or right away. Right. Exactly. That's the thing. See, they, they don't, they can't necessarily outrun fate, but they can outrun maybe this version of fate <laughs> until the they, next they one. Can't, they can't outrun death. Right. And I mean, it's actually funny that you say that because I remember being in a theater um, when they had a final destination trailer and I just started laughing when they were at the racetrack and the, no, the tire, the like, tire hits the woman, cat. and I'm like, I'm like dying laughing. And but see, you're supposed to laugh like, there because oh she's so stupid. What is wrong with you? I'm like, this she's is not funny as attention. hell. It's like she's just getting killed. Yeah. That's happening. Like this is just crazy. It's like, my God, people are gonna think you're nuts. I'm like, yeah, and then they won't mess with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, two things to to close out for real this time. Yes. Um, one. I think the that really boring speech about Bob or whoever the hell the 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 older lady's brother was. Yeah, Bobby. It yeah, Bobby. It not only did it go nowhere, the problem I think was that they were going somewhere. This lady helped our final girl, Chris, into the truck and was like, I'm gonna get you to the hospital because she saw that she was bleeding profusely from the ankle. She got some kind of a rod or something through it. Um, and they're speeding through this woods and they're going far really fast and it's an endless like kind of forest road but i'm thinking like the further they get along like we have not established that this guy has jason voorhees-esque powers he does walk everywhere <laughs> there's no way he's like gonna come out of the woods and, and attack them at this point they're they're practically into the next state uh so that kind of like took <laughs> some of the ten the tension out of it for I me i thought he was in the cab behind her in the pickup i was if if they had been a little bit clever about this there would have been some mystery about whatever happened to johnny's mother and they would have made the lady in the truck a little bit older so that way mm -hmm. you could say you know uh is she oh, I, here with that I, wound or not or or something yeah or you know i i will always i miss my necklace or something like that or maybe she mm -hmm. kept the necklace uh you know on her person and mm -hmm. the lady notices like oh that used to be mine mm -hmm. um but the other thing i'll say in terms of I think one of my all-time favorite twists on the genre, Cabin in the Woods, that's a great call out, Jeff, but that's sort of like, that's so meta that it's, you, exactly. know, it, you can't even categorize it in the same, you know, category. Not quite, uh, you're right. An almost perfect film, I think, up until the last act, and it's kind of a shame, is Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Mm. You've got the, the mm. oh, Katie? I know a story about the director on that, and I will not refer to that film at all. Oh, well, then I will refer to it. There, there goes our Ty Cobb discussion. <laughs> okay, so I will just say, <laughs> now I want to hear this story, and I you don't talk about Woody time. Allen movies ever. I'll well, I'll tell you that story. I'll tell you that story where we're not recording. Okay, well that that story I think is. Okay, let's just assume that in an alternate universe, it was made by a person that uh, I assume was not a piece of garbage based on what you're alluding to. Um, I would say I love that it take that that kids in the woods kind of trope with the uh, the redneck killers um, and it, it put turns it on its ear. And I think it's it's funny. It's gross. Uh, it's kind of tender in parts. Um, but yeah, once the uh, the real killer is kind of revealed and all that stuff, it kind of falls apart. But in ter Jeff, in terms of what you're talking about, I, I you've seen Tucker and Dale, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. um, is that was that 
your bag? Did you did you like it? Did you like what it was trying to do? Um, you know, I don't have a great memory of it. I my, so my guess is that it might have been, uh, you know, decent or fair to middling or whatever. Um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't put it up there in the pantheon of films that I think are impressive of the last twenty years of horror per se. But you might be right. That might be getting close to something. I do think you have a good point, though. I think that you know something that's just going for blood sport is difficult for me. Um, you know, I had a little trouble with the hostile movies. I didn't have as much trouble with green inferno because they were trying to get out of that. And I thought, you know, there were at least people to try to root for there as awful as some of that violence was too. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's a little bit of a tricky subject. You're accurate about that, uh, uh, Dr. Simmons. So I'm <laughs> sorry to be on your couch. I don't know what that means, but look at you, MD. Look at that. <laughs> I just I, I'm I'm kind of over that kind of stuff. So maybe it's a a blind spot or a unforgivingness that I have. Sort of like what? Katie with that director, I guess. Well, <laughs> but I mean that's the thing. It's like it's it's some people have. And that's the thing is like movies are an objective art form, but they mm -hmm. are subjective in terms of our relationships to them. Right. You know, people yep. can love or hate movies mm -hmm. for any number of reasons, and as much as I'm going to kick myself for saying it, there's no wrong reaction to a movie, even though my intellect, my, my inner mm -hmm. snob is like, there's absolutely a bad reaction to a movie. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, it's all good. And, and we're all still friends, I think. Yes. And I, I love that. I think appropriately, uh, this has been one of the most contentious episodes of the kicking the seat podcast. I've, oh, I've had the pleasure of moderating. So in um, a violent nature. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So thank you, uh, uh, Katie and Jeff for, for hanging out and talking about this film. Thank you everybody who's watching this. If you came back and you heeded our warnings, you know, uh, to watch the film and then come back for the spoiler section. Hope you had a good time. Uh, what did you think of a violent, in a violent nature? Leave your comments below. Be sure and like, and subscribe if you liked, uh, and want to subscribe to this, be sure and check out, uh, my dear friends and fellow earth's mightiest critics. Their information will be down below. And, um, yeah, I, just before I sign off, Katie and Jeff, you have anything else to say briefly? Cause we're almost at the runtime of the film here. <laughs> I've said quite enough, I think so. No. All right. I say see it in the theater and uh, look forward to seeing it on Shutter when it comes out, um, you know, on Shutter. Do you, is there a date for that? I, I should know this, but and maybe I'll put it up if I have it. But have I, they announced when it's coming out? I do not know. I know May 31st uh, is theatrical release, um, but I'm not sure when Shutter. I would guess like a month or two later, maybe three. Or if it, it follows the Fall Guy tra trajectory, it'll be out in like two weeks. Ooh, Same sad. with uh, uh, Late Night with the Devil was, I think, in three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I and like that was that movie. That's thing. my favorite horror movie of the year so far. There you go. Um, yes, definitely watch Late Night with the Devil. Hell, make it a double feature, um, but put on a lot of coffee. <laughs> a lot of coffee. Lot anyway. Of coffee. <laughs> All right. Thanks, gang. And take care. Thank you.